Okay. But before I could ask him anything, he decided he didn't want to talk. I'm going to fire whoever scheduled this interview. <laughs> Why? Well, 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 well what's, what's the name of the show? Uh, we haven't titled it yet. Oh, okay. It's probably... Uh, okay. The government is wasting your money. They are corrupt and incompetent. Look, I'm getting less and less interested in doing this interview, I've got to tell you. Um, I really am. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure how I got here, but... Well, we, well, we told you it was a consumer report on government, told yeah. your staff. Yeah. Look, I really don't want to do this. And he walked off the set. So this kind of thing started to make ABC a little squeamish. Um, they didn't like it that the interior secretary was walking out of an interview with that Stossel guy. I, mean, I, I don't view that as a confrontation. Mark Skousen suggested this title, but to me it's just asking questions that ought to be asked. I'm surprised the press doesn't do it more often. I mean, another example. I did a show called Greed, based on Ayn Rand's concept of it, and uh, David Kelly of the Atlas Society, he's here at this conference, I don't know if he's here tonight, he gave me this idea with this odd question saying to me, what, what's so great about Mother Teresa? What's so great about altruism? Who, who did more for the world? Mother Teresa or Michael Milken? Now, Micah Milken had just gone to jail for securities fraud. But the fact is, David Kelly was right. Mother Teresa actually is not, was not such a nice person as it turned out, but she helped some people and she was altruistic and she wanted to help. But Michael Milken, I, I don't know if he really did something evil and what he was jailed for, but I do know that he invented junk bonds. And by doing that, he gave birth to lots of companies, lots of wealth, lots of jobs, lots of opportunity for people. Maybe by some calculations, a million jobs. Mother Teresa didn't accomplish nearly that much good. Which made me think about Bill Gates, which was being, who was being vilified for being the richest guy in the world at the time. And he, back left Microsoft and now he's doing charity work and he's doing it well. He's really trying to measure what works and what doesn't. But it raises the question, who does more for the world? The person who gives to charity or the entrepreneur? I should give to charity because I don't have any great entrepreneurial skills and I do. Makes me feel good. People who give to charity are happier. But I would think Bill Gates shouldn't. He should keep keep working on making software better. People who can create jobs should keep creating jobs. So this led to a talk with one job creator, Ted Turner. Uh, the billionaire had just made the biggest charitable gift ever in American history. He gave a billion dollars to the UN. Exactly, that was my reaction. The UN? They're famous for squandering money. And yet, what did Turner do? I mean, Turner had created a billboard company, radio stations, TNT, bad old movies, CNN. All right, I'm not crazy about it either, but it was useful. He did good stuff for the world as an entrepreneur. So I asked Turner, guys in the back, will you roll that? money way better than creating all these yeah, jobs. I didn't say it was. Yes, They're both did. good. No, I didn't. But you're creating jobs in both, why not do both? Am I wrong in thinking that I'm happy if Bill Gates gives nothing to charity? But wouldn't you be happier if he did? What are you, but just what are you just hear, beating hear, on me about? You're just another, this is why people don't like newsmen. Well, I'm a newsman too. I know your dirty tricks. Yes, all right. There's nothing more to say. Goodbye. I'm walking off the set. <laughs> Another guy walks out. 
he just could not get his brain around the idea that his entrepreneurship was more valuable. I mean, you're, you're weird, you people in here, because you understand this. Most Americans don't. And politicians are, are much stupider. They think nothing good happens unless government makes it happen. And hence, you get President Obama and his directions for changing a light bulb. Central planning. Obama was elected on the slogan of, yes, we can. But to him, we was government, government directing people. Sadly, this makes sense to people. I mean, we can't focus on everything. I don't know how to build a sewage treatment plant. We want experts to control things, especially a guy who went to Harvard. It's intuitive to want to trust the experts rather than this amorphous thing called the market. And Obviously, Obama did some terrible things, and he certainly made government bigger. Is Trump going to be better? I don't know. He, he acts like he wants to be king. On the other hand, he's done wonderful things. He proposed a budget that was going to cut almost every department, agriculture, commerce. I went into Times Square and asked people, what does the Commerce Department do? No one had any idea. He wanted to cut the endowment for the arts. Government shouldn't be running funding arts. It's just nuts. These were wonderful ideas. He was vilified in the press. And did you know this? Bet you never knew this happened. All his cuts never happened. In fact, the Republican Congress increased spending on every department that Trump wanted to cut. But that's so routine, it didn't even make the news. They just spend more. He's also appointed some good people. I just, I'm stunned to see free marketers in government. Betsy DeVos, Pruitt at the EPA, Mulvaney, a tough budget guy, budget director, Naomi Rowe, the Justice Gorsuch was a good pick. People from the Reason Foundation are working in government now, trying to pare it back. This is wonderful. At the same time, we get Jeff Sessions and Wilbur Ross. Linda McMahon at the Small Business Administration, I'm not sure what to think about her because I sued her once because she and her husband had me beaten up by a professional wrestler once. <laughs> but she does talk about limiting government, so maybe it's good that she's there. On the other hand, she's head of the Small Business Administration. Why does that even exist? Why is there an SBA? So cronies can give grants to certain businesses. You'd think under a Republican administration, they'd say, we're going to abolish the SBA. I'm still hopeful. So far, I haven't heard a peep about that. Anyway, many of these politicians won't talk to me anymore once I established a reputation as someone who asks annoying questions and also is quoted as saying he hates politicians. They, they don't agree to an interview as often. Um, local politicians, however, are, are often so eager for FaceTime on television that they will sit down. One in New York introduced a bill to ban a certain amount of uh, salt and fat in all food. You could not sell foods that had more than X amount of fat and salt. And then, in his theory, because he was forcing us to eat healthier, he had the nerve to say he was giving us more choice. Roll the tape on that, please. You're giving us more choice. You're banning things. You're giving us less choice. Well, it, let me just say, uh, it, you're absolutely right. I'm trying to ban those stuff that is not good for the consumer. You're a bully. Well, the, I've been calling worse. <laughs> What business is it of yours what I put in my own body? Isn't that part of freedom? If we are not into healthy lifestyle, government will be blamed for not doing the right thing. So because government is responsible, because we have a socialized healthcare system, you get to take away my freedom? I think what I'm trying to do is to help you to have a better life. You're like 
a cancer. You're spreading a bad <laughs> thing that costs a lot of money and doesn't do any good. And I am a good cancer. I like the way he smiled when he said that. A good cancer. Could this be like a new name for politicians? What's worse than politicians? Some union bosses. The next video is the head of the Washington, D.C. Teachers Union. He opposes choice, of course. Uh, he wants every kid to be stuck in a government-run, unionized school. But when I interviewed him, he had a problem because the test results had just come out and the kids in his school did terribly. So I confronted him about that. Roll tape. Awful, they're among the lowest in the nation. You make an argument that it's the lowest in the nation based upon the test scores. Now. I would say that ours can get better, but I would say that ours are... Your predecessors, the unions have been saying that for years. I think the unions have uh, a pretty strong history of advocating for high quality public education. But not achieving it. Our test scores are not what we uh, uh, choose to focus on. We choose to focus on teaching kids. But how do you know if they're learning anything if you don't test them and compare? I know my kids are learning when I look in their eyes. That's evidence for you. It's also what we in my business called a TV moment. You talk to people, and by and large, people are boring or they're evasive. But every once in a while, they say something where you, you think, ooh, that'll, that's educational. That makes the point. And those are the magic moments, and, and that was one. Finally, talking about confrontations, I've had a couple with Donald Trump before he became President Trump. One was positive. Uh, he said sensible things about taxes, about state taxes, which idiots were trying to raise in New York and pass a rich person's tax. And he said, rich people will, need, will leave New York. I said, well, you haven't. And he said in his normal egotism, well, that'll be a big story if I leave, won't it? <laughs> but he was totally right about rich people leaving. At the time, the governor of Maryland had passed a millionaire's tax and was going to raise all this money to pay for this and that. And at the end of the year, they found they had less money because people left. That's what people do. The other interview with... Mr. Trump was not positive. He was trying to use eminent domain law to kick a woman out of her home in Atlantic City so he could expand the parking lot for his casino. And I said to him, you know, in the old days, developers would get people out of their property by showing up with thugs who had clubs. You're like that, but you just use lawyers instead, and politicians. And he got ticked off and said, that's very unfair, John. You are jaded. Yeah, I am. These are good public servants protecting the people of Atlantic City. Other people use thugs today. I don't. We have been so nice to this woman. Now, you can decide whether he had been nice to this woman or not. She. He wanted her house, I say, if you wanted it, he should buy it. He should have to pay whatever she wants. It's her private property, or she should have to build around her, as people do. But what happened in this case it, is that people did offer her money. They offered her a million dollars for the house, and she said no. So rather than offer her a million and a half, Trump went to New Jersey politicians and got her house condemned as blighted. And the politicians said Trump could have the land not for a million dollars that she'd turned down, but for 250000 To my mind, he was ripping her off for at least $750,000. Of course, if you roll the tape, Trump said he was protecting people from blight. 
terrible house instead of staring at beautiful fountains and beautiful other things that would be good. You're bullying these people out because not, they're... Excuse me, that's wrong. But for the, you to use the word bully, John, is very unfair. This is a government case. This is not Donald Trump. Yes, it's Donald Trump. It's you and your cronies in government working together. For you to call these people cronies is very unfair. But at least he was willing to talk about it. Everybody criticizes Trump for tweeting, but I kind of like it because he's out there. He's showing that he's a fallible human being that politicians are not magic, that they are as fallible as everybody else, and we ought to think twice about granting them so much power. So I think it's great that he talks about it. Anyway, that's a sample of what I've done in the past. I worked for eight years at WCBS doing consumer reporting, been 28 years at ABC, eventually became 2020 co-anchor, I switched from leftist consumer reporter calling for more regulation to this weirdo libertarian who was saying government should be limited. They just didn't know what to do with that at ABC. But they did know that I was good at TV and I was getting ratings. So they indulged me and they gave me some specials. Um, and they were surprised when they rated well. The first one was, are we scaring ourselves to death? I wanted to call it, we are scaring you to death, but they wouldn't let me do that. Thank you for clapping. This was a big one, a turning point in my career because two producers quit rather than work on that show. And nobody quits in television. But they said that this isn't journalism, this is conservative dogma because I was arguing that some regulation kills people because wealthier is healthier and the regulation slowed the economy and when you're poorer, people die. They could not deal with that. But then the show ran, scientists liked it, it got good ratings. I survived another 15 years at ABC but when Obama was about to be elected, I couldn't get my stories on. I had done a show on school choice when it was just beginning, Stupid in America. It's another one where, oh, thank you. Where I learned about choice and the options and I was worried that I would never get another special again because it wasn't sexy. It wasn't dancing girls or sports on TV. It was kids sitting at desks. What if nobody watched? And then we got the ratings and they were very good to everybody's astonishment. So five years later, there was a real school choice movement. Uh, I wanted to do an update on that. And they said, ah, oh, you're doing, you're just predictable. All this libertarian stuff, I don't like it. You know, I just, why don't you do breast enlargement or diet, stuff we know works. And I refused and we fought. I did another show after Michael Moore came out with his movie Sicko about government health care and how great it was in Cuba and other countries. We debunked that and now Obamacare was coming and I wanted to update that in terms of Obamacare. Again, the message was, yeah, this is predictable. We're not, we're not interested. And so I left and went to Fox and I worked seven years at Fox. Fox gave me my own show on the business channel, often they repeated it on the regular channel. I give Fox credit, they never censored me. I did stories on... <laughs> Fox fans here. I did stories on things that you'd think that Roger Ailes and the Fox culture would not have liked. On gay marriage, on legalizing sex work, on legalizing drugs on shrinking the military, on fewer involvements overseas. Not a peep, they never censored anything. But this year I gave up the Fox show because I want to have more time to do investigations and also some of the confrontations like I showed you tonight. I said they weren't confrontations because 
Mark made me use that word, but I guess they were confrontations. But I want to do more of that. With, with editing, they, they are enlightening. And I said to Rupert Murdoch, let me do fewer shows and leave me free to do some other stuff and work with people in the liberty movement. And he said, okay, you can do that, but instead of doing fewer shows, why don't you do none of your shows anymore and just stay here, be a contributor, which I am, and uh, that's what's happened. And then I went out trying to raise money and with the help of some of you, Actually, I think just one of you here, John Egliolara, I raised money to open our own studio in New York City and to make Liberty videos. And to put them out, not necessarily on television, because a lot of you, like me here, are old. And you know, we're, we don't matter. It's the young people who matter. Well, we matter because we vote, but we're going to die soon, and I want to reach the young people, the Bernie Sanders people, because they need to be educated. And my son, who works in social media, said, Dad, you know, they're never going to listen to you as long as you're on Fox. And I think he has a point. Fox has that reputation. And he said, there's this new thing. You don't need a television station anymore. There's Facebook and Twitter and social media and people share stuff with friends. To which I said, huh? <laughs> but a couple of years later, I realized he was right. And now I have 900,000 Twitter followers with Facebook and all these other media. We can, we can reach as many people as I was reaching on Fox Business Network. So I'm going to make Liberty videos and we're going to put them out via Reason TV and Facebook and Twitter, Instagram, YouTube. I hope you're applauding Reason TV because Reason is wonderful. Reason is what finally helped me move from left to libertarian. I was lost in the media world. I had been a liberal all my life and it wasn't working. I saw how government was failing. I read National Review and they seemed to want to bomb the whole world and police the bedroom. That didn't make sense. And then I found reason and it was, wow, oh, I have one here. These people really get it better than I do. And so now I've joined them and we're going to make a video together. Can you roll the tape? Here's our first one. We released this today. Extinct. A race against time to save the rhinos. Poachers massacre rhinos for their horns. Some are carved into ornaments. Some are ground up and sold for medicine. Just one of these can sell for as much as $300,000. It's no wonder. Around 500 rhinos have been slain by poachers in South Africa so far this year. Poaching became the biggest business. The upcoming documentary Horn Maker features entrepreneur Matt Marcus who says he has a solution to poaching. Create more rhino horns, artificial horn, then flood the market with that. One way to devalue something is actually to create a lot of it. There'd be no incentive to poach anymore. That's correct. And when things are abundant, people don't fight, kill, or, or, or steal. South Africa once tried something similar. For 20 years, they made it legal to own rhinos and sell their horns. Farmers would put the rhinos to sleep with tranquilizer darts, saw off their horns, and sell the horn. Because this was legal, Rhino farmers had an incentive to breed rhinos and protect them. The rhino population quadrupled, but then South Africa banned sales of rhino horn again. Poaching went down? No, it went up. It went up by uh, thousands of percent. And there are fears that the rhino could be extinct within 10 years. So Marcus's idea, artificial horn, might save the rhino. I would think the people who want to preserve wildlife would love this idea. I would think they'd love it too. But no. All these environmental groups hate his idea. This is dangerous. What they're doing is 
absolutely dangerous for rhinos Why? and their survival. This is greenwashing, a, an illegal activity. Legal sales, say environmental groups, might increase rhino killing. That happened once with elephants. It started up new carving industry in China that had been dormant for, for decades. It needs to be long enough to bring the prices down. And then people say, eh, there's no money in poaching. So the problem is that people still perceive animals as commodities, as natural resources What's wrong for their with that? use. Yeah, they are. Well, they have inherent I, I eat eggs. That's a commodity from a chicken. What's wrong with that? Are we really going to now just farm every single animal on this planet so we can con endlessly continue supplying this like bloodlust and thirst of people to consume wildlife products? If that's what it takes to preserve the animals, your bans have failed. Last year, Kenya burned 100 tons of confiscated elephants and rhino horns. Mm -hmm. Poaching is up. A thousand park rangers have been killed by poachers. Your ban is cruel to people and animals. The increase in poaching is a direct responsibility of the folks in China and Vietnam that are pushing this product onto innocent consumers. So sell them a substitute cheap product and this will stop. You people have your head in the sand. But a cheap product that does nothing. Organizations like mine are partnering with the Vietnamese government to reduce demand for rhino horn. And failing. No, we're succeeding. That's the thing. So we've reached about 40 million Vietnamese in the last three years. Reach means 40 million people supposedly saw her public relations campaign. Please help protect my family from rhino poachers. A Humane Society survey found videos like this persuaded many people that rhino horns have no medical value. Don't use rhino horn. It cannot make you healthy. So what? People are still poaching the rhinos. So it takes time. It takes time for that trickle-down effect. It's fine if environmental groups try to convince people not to buy rhino horn. But their hostility to capitalism makes them blind to better ideas like artificial horn and South Africa's new plan to legalize horn sales again. South Africa is going against the international body that's fighting to protect rhinos. So what? These international bodies are stupid. No, well, there are folks like me that, that work to pass these restrictions. But it's like the drug war. You can ban it, but if there's money to be made, the poachers are still going to kill the animals. Prohibition should have taught us that when something's valuable, banning its consumption leads to lawbreaking and killing. Nobody kills anybody anymore for beer or wine or scotch. When you're talking about beer or wine or scotch, you don't have lives on, on the line. Lives of the people who were killed by Al Capone. Well, of course, but you know, he was a criminal and you have criminal he networks here. He was a criminal are... because alcohol was illegal. Yeah, I mean, this, this is, this is an endless argument. We can't live in a lawless society. <laughs> a free society is not a lawless society. Markets are not lawless. Legal rhino farming or selling fake horn could save endangered animals. But the environmental groups just can't see that. So that's an example. Thank you, that's my next chapter of my career. We'll do two videos a week. The first will run every Tuesday on Reason TV. I hope to bring liberty and the ideas behind it to the young people who won't watch Fox. And I'd also like to train some young people to replace me because I'm old and wizened and people like Naomi Brockwell I'm working with to replace me someday. So thank you for helping if you can. Uh, if you have ideas and stories we think we should do, please send us video. We need video more than just the ideas, unless you discover something amazing. Send us the video. You can just email it to john at johnstossel.com and we'll look at that. And if you want to support us financially, even better. Because we're just talking to ourselves too often here. Mark Skousen did a wonderful thing with this conference and 3,000 people showed up, and that's great, but 20,000 showed up at Bernie rallies. We have to work harder to talk to other people. And the best way I know is video, because the young kids are watching videos on their phones all day. They're not reading white papers from the Cato Institute. 
So video is the way to go. I put some in, in classrooms with Stossel in the classroom. Bob Chittister started me on that and Andrea Rich took it over after Bob got too political for ABC's taste. Uh, we need to reach outside our group because these ideas are what makes life good for people. And we need to help people find that. Thank you for helping us do that. I'm going to go sign books. Thank you. I'm going to go sign books in the Versailles room. Hope to see some of you there. Like the legend of